Hello, Eorsians! I'm Lukeel Bravestone, and welcome to another episode of Remnants of a Realm. Last week, we looked back at Vesper Bay, Orem Vale, and interactive transportation. And yes, I know that Vesper Bay's ferry connection with Limsa is still the fastest way to get to the Waking Sands. I know, but it's not even comparable to how important that connection was in 1.0. So yes, it is a shadow of its former self. Anyway, let's move on to our first location for today, Thanalan. Whoa, 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 whoa there, hold up, Lukeel. Are you seriously doing an entire zone? Well, other me, I'm glad you asked. No, I'm not. However, seeing as we've run out of instanced and open dungeons, we're going to start looking closer at special hotspots in certain zones and check up on their status in 2.0. To start it all off, let's pay a visit to Camp Drybone. Camp Drybone was established sometime between 1560 and 1572 and served as a waypoint for adventurers and traders alike. The camp was most famous for its church of Saint Adama Landama, whose likeness can be found on the guild leaf plate for munificence. The camp had all the basic amenities expected from a camp of its size, a vendor, mender, and an etherite with connections to ethereal gates in Halatali, and yes, we're going to visit that one one day, the Burning Wall and Sand Gate. After the calamity, Drybone grew drastically. No longer a tiny encampment, it has become a large settlement in the western part of Eastern Sandalan. The most likely reason for this sudden growth is the fact that the Church of Adama Landama does not charge for their burials, and the existing Eralg burial chambers in Ulda are currently overflowing with the dead. After the Calamity, most of those who perished in the horrors of the Calamity were put to rest here. Now let's step back to 1.0 and the Golden Bazaar. The Golden Bazaar was located in the far north of eastern Thanalan and served as a waypoint for traders making their journey along the Royal Alag Sunway. However, as time went on and settlements like Camp Drybone popped up around it, business started to decline and it became more of a ghost town than a bustling merchant waypoint. With patch 1.22a, the Golden Bazaar became a hamlet defense location, breathing life into the area once again. Today, the Golden Bazaar has fallen into harder times. Camp Drybone has grown to such a size there is no longer any need for the Golden Bazaar's services. That was until the recent discovery of the Forgotten City ruins, unearthed as a result of the Calamity, stirred new life into the settlement. Mithril mining has also picked up in the area. Now the main building from 1.0 has been moved to a rather odd location, here, and new buildings have popped up. In fact, there's very little left of the original Golden Bazaar at all, except for that dilapidated main building. Will it ever regain its former glory? Time will tell. Let's go back to 1.0 and looking to the west, just south of Camp Horizon, we find the lesser known brother of the Golden Bazaar, the Silver Bazaar. The Silver Bazaar was once a bustling waypoint for all manner of goods coming in from across the seas. After the fall of Alamigo, however, the Alamegan refugees took over the Silver Bazaar, turning it into an Alamegan fishing settlement. This is one of many 1.0 locations and settlements that had the city-state icon used in 1.0 to indicate that it was a hamlet. And from that, one would quickly assume that this was intended to become a hamlet defense location, as that's mostly what these icons were used for. Looking closer at its design, it confirms this suspicion. Buildings with guild icons on them and crafting benches was a clear indication that this was going to become a hamlet defense location. However, no hamlet defense was ever added to the Silver Bazaar. The game ended before anything was implemented there. The bazaar went from a super important trade waypoint to a long forgotten place, riddled with poverty and disrepair. However, the fishing business picked up for the small settlement. Things didn't exactly get any better after the calamity. Today, the silver bazaar is barely recognizable as a bazaar at all. The fishing trade started drying up shortly after the calamity, so many left the bazaar altogether, selling the deeds to their homes to the Hammerly developer. Only the tiny square remains, and the once bustling fishing docks just down the hill. It doesn't look like the sun will shine on the Silver Bazaar anytime soon. I mean, it shines, but moving on. 
The last location on our tour is Mithril Pit T8. It was located south of Camp Drybone, with Halatali as the closest teleport point. The Mithril Pit T8 was once a quiet little inn, but when hostilities erupted with the Amalja, the inn was abandoned. In the game, this area served only as a place to repair gear and buy basic items. Today, there is no trace of the inn in Eastern Thanalan. It was most likely torn down as it had been abandoned for quite a while. There is, however, a bar in Camp Drybone with no name. Could the Mithril Pit T8 have been moved to this location instead? The size sure resembles that of the original exterior of the inn. Who knows? If you know anything about this, let me know in the comments. So that was our locations for this episode. Now let's take a look at something a lot of people like to bring forth as a positive thing about 1.0 that we no longer have in 2.0. Yes, we're finally talking about it. Seamless Zones. Now for those of you that are unfamiliar with 1.0's loading system, basically, once you loaded into the game, the entire region became available without any loading zones. So that meant that if you logged into Limsa Luminsa, you had access to Upper, Lower, Eastern and Western Linosha without ever having to wait for a loading screen to finish. To make it even more incredible, the maps were pretty massive and required a lot of time to walk across. Now, here's the thing about the seamless zones that were present in 1.0. They might have felt seamless, but there was a lot of trickery involved here that just masked the loading screens. The loading tunnels. This is just a term I'm using, but in most cases they can be classified as such. Basically, these areas were long, narrow corridors, often blocking the view ahead of you and behind you, forcing you to walk for quite a while without anything happening. In some cases, having you to move around quite a bit to actually get to the end of the tunnel. What actually happened here is that what you left behind was unloaded, the zone transitioned, and the other zone loaded in, hence why your view was obstructed both ways when crossing zones. Now let's take a look at Guidania's loading tunnel. This incredibly way too brightly red canopy covered loading tunnel would take approximately 30 seconds to cross, with nothing going on inside. And yes, the long bridge you see in Limsa Lominsa in 2.0 was actually one you had to cross to access Limsa Lominsa in 1.0. For Uldar, they implemented a quite awkward way to access the city-state, through the sides, not the main gate, and this was one of those design choices they had to make in order to facilitate the illusion of a seamless world. Now my absolute worst type of loading tunnels were the ones between overworld zones. They were always these winding paths with rocks in the way and these open areas in the middle with absolutely nothing going on in them. They forced you to actually move and pay attention to where you were going, which became really annoying over time as you would often cross zones to do leaves <laughs> and quests. Today, zone dividers are a common nuisance and for the most part it seems like an okay compromise. They have basically removed the annoying walk for 30 seconds with nothing happening, keep your eyes on the screen aspect, and instead allowed you some time to think about your life, your problems, your future, your unpaid bills, and your sad existence. Now one thing that, if you've been following the channel for a while you know this, I really cannot for the life of me understand, is the need to split the city-states in two. In 1.0 these were singular zones, no upper and lower decks loading screens. Yes, they had loading tunnels too, but they were way shorter and they didn't feel as useless. In Limsa the upper decks are upstairs, of course we have to use the stairs to get there. In Ulda, well, no, there's no need for a zone divider here. What? And Gridania, actually Gridania is a mess, I just burned it down to be honest. We may never know why they decided to split the city-states like this, but oh, oh, false faults go away! Anyway, we've reached the end of this episode, my friends, but don't cry. We will meet again next week with another brain-blowing episode of Remnants of a Realm. I feel like taking a walk in Curthus for that one. Hmm. Let me know what you think of this week's topics in the comments below. Do you cry salty tears for the fate of the Golden and Silver Bazaar? Do you think they'll ever come back? Does dry bone make you dry? And what is your opinion on the zone dividers and loading screens? 
Just a heads up to anyone watching our podcast, we're currently running an artwork contest. The best artwork gets featured at the end of the podcast and on our grand spanking new website coming soon. Send in your artwork at speakersofflyland at gmail.com. See you next week, ARCians, and may you ever walk in the light of the crystal.